Well, today's subject is about our scripture reading, Galatians 3, 28, 29. I was inspired to choose this topic after watching Sister Emma Beyonce's presentation in France. I'm not going to repeat her message, but it influenced me to study the topic and look at aspects of it in a somewhat different way. I liked her organization and I am in agreement with her conclusions. But there are some points that I am viewing from a different direction and there are others that I want to expand upon. Her uh, presentation was excellent with many important points and I re recommend that you all watch it. And I have to read a lot because I can't remember <laughs> to read and put everything in there. But um, after kind of some of the other things that I've been reading and even digressed a little bit from, you know, in studying what she put out, I just had so much that I wanted to share that seemed like it kind of came together that, I, you know, it's kind of a diverse thing here instead of just following her presentation. Um, she called her presentation Breaking Down the Wall, which alludes to the breaking down of the middle wall of partition in the sanctuary. And it also applied to the breaking down of the wall between the Jews and the Gentiles. In um, CIHS, which is Christ in his sanctuary, it's written, when Christ was crucified, the inner veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, signifying that the great final sacrifice had been made and that the system of sacrificial offerings was forever at an end. And that veil was the partition that separated the holy to the most holy place. Um, so I want to call my presentation Free Access to God because that is what happened also at the same time that, that partition came down. We had free access to God. Now Sister Emma's presentation starts off with looking at God's purpose for his church from Acts of the Apostles, page 9.1. And I'm going to read that paragraph. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service, and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan, and through his, that through his church shall be reflected to the world his fullness and sufficiency. Members of the church, those whom he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light, are to show forth his glory. The church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ, and through the church will eventually be made manifest, even to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, the final and full display of the love of God. So um, she was showing us in by using um, our methodology of compare and contrast and repeat and enlarge some of these uh, truths here that we find. It's you know pretty much packed in here, all these principles. And they're here. The purpose of God's church, the salvation of mankind, which means everybody. It's to carry the gospel to the world. And from the beginning, which is the Alpha. It, we are to reflect God's fullness to the world. We're to show forth His glory and marvelous light. And she applied here Revelation 18.1 where um, the angel comes down to bring the marvelous light. And that is to lighten the earth, which is the world. And then it says, Final the final, which is the omega, the final and full display is of the love of God. And that goes to the whole universe. That's where it hit really enlarges there. 
um, and that said here in that sentence, to the principalities and powers of heavenly places, which includes all of heaven and, all, and the unfallen worlds as well, the whole universe. So one that I kind of, this other one I didn't have on my notes, so the bottom line then is the gospel equals saving mankind, all mankind. Um, it's to reflect the character of God Not that great of a writer. And um, to display the love of God. And that's to everyone whole world. Um, I just thought it was so neat that right in that same paragraph you have the Alpha and the Omega. And so we see that the purpose of God's church to bring the gospel from the beginning all the way to the end, it's the same. To display the love of God. So now I'm going to talk about how God has demonstrated his love by laws and his communication with us through the ages. God's laws are designed by him to nurture and support his creation. His working with man is ever the same. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. An example of his law is the law of nature. We know that if you violate a law of nature, there are consequences. Many of us may not know all the laws of physics, but we do know about the law of gravity and the danger of falling from high places. I also, it occurred to me that that, that could be physical or spiritual and prophetic. Mm -hmm. Falling from high places. Mm -hmm. If by some circumstance a person falls or is physically injured in an accident, he would want medical aid to remedy his injury. It's not the fault of the law of gravity or some other law of physics that is violated, it's due to the violation of the law, whether intentional or unintentional. We know that the laws of physics are essential to the proper maintenance of the universe. So the Ten Commandments are spiritual and prophetic laws, and some of them can be understood in a practical way, but primarily they are principles which must be discerned spiritually and prophetically. In the New Testament, we find in Luke 10, 27, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. The law of God is about love and obedience to the principles which nurture and maintain us spiritually and prophetically. They teach us to love and treat others well and they also counsel us to respect God as our creator and the designer of universal laws. And as I mentioned this morning, I was um, thinking about this, I guess this was in my mind, uh, about obedience is, you know, respecting God and that he knows uh, a higher, you know, he's smarter than us, okay? Mm -hmm. So when he's giving us advice, we should heed it. And I was, I've often wondered, why does, is it, there's so much here about, um, 
loving God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, with all my mind. It, you know, I kind of used to think of it as that's kind of overkill or something, you know. <laughs> but then I'm thinking, you know, in the light of what we're learning and even what um, Dr. Jennings was talking about, that that is a way of really making a stronger bond and a better and an understanding that uh, God is smarter than uh, mortal man and um, that we should trust his advice and his promises above those of mortal man, even people in our own families, perhaps. Um, so here is a passage from Review and Herald, August 15, 1893, paragraph 7. Yes, he beholds his people in this world, which is a persecuting world, and all seared and marred with the curse, and knows that they need all the divine resources of his sympathy and his love. Our forerunner hath for us entered in within the veil, and yet by the golden chain of love and truth, he is linked with his people in closest sympathy. In this passage, Ellen White tells us this world is a persecuting world and that God's people are seared and marred with the curse. <coughs> so I'm going to suggest that they got to be all seared and marred with the curse by their own violation of spiritual and prophetic laws. That God hasn't been cursing and punishing us for transgressions, but that the transgressions have a damaging side effect inherent within them. Whatever curse there is, we trigger by our own transgression of the law. And, what, and that God all along has prophesied to us what would happen if we violate the laws, which have been designed to nurture and sustain us. So now I'm going to tell you an, a kind of overview of mankind from Eden to the time of Christ. I haven't really been paying attention to my time. Um, humanity started out in the Garden of Eden. It was by succumbing to the temptation of Lucifer to believe a lie for selfish gain that Eve violated the principle that God counseled them about, which was not to eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Speaking about this practically, I think that most of us can understand that there are some things that we are better off not knowing or doing. Yet once it's done, it can't be undone. There's damage to be healed. God's character is to love us and make a way for our healing. We know that in Genesis 3.15, a Savior was promised to come from the seed of the woman. Adam and Eve were cursed by their behavior and the events which befell them were the natural or practical consequence of their own actions. Yet God had a plan for their redemption. The history of the Bible shows us that at every turn when mankind has violated God's law, there were consequences, and by the time of Noah, there was only one righteous family left by which the seed of the Savior could enter into the world, and God had a plan for their survival. Throughout history of God's people, as they became selfish and fell away from the counsel of God, God still loved them and brought them prophecy to warn them and to guide them. As mankind continued to selfishly violate God's law of love, God called out Abraham from whom to develop, to develop a church. The children of Abraham would become an ancient, would become ancient Israel and they were also called Jews, and were very proud to be the children of Abraham. So God's plan adapted as mankind continued to violate God's law. God continued to love and nurture and sustain a way for mankind to be redeemed, 
a way for the seed of the Savior to come into the world. Many of the children of Abraham continued their selfish ways and eventually, through the consequences of their own behaviors, went into captivity. But God continued to love them and they were given another opportunity to rededicate themselves to his service and for the purpose of their healing and redemption. And that's what we've been learning in our Sabbath school lessons. So here is a reading from Acts of the Apostles 13.2 to 15.1. Uh, from the beginning, God has wrought through his people to bring blessing to the world. To the ancient Egyptian nation, God made Joseph a fountain of life. Through the integrity of Joseph, the life of that whole people was preserved. And this is showing how God intended um, Israelites and Jews to share this information with other nations. Through Daniel, God saved the life of all the wise men of Babylon. And these deliverances are as object lessons. They illustrate the spiritual blessings offered to the world through connection with, God, with the God whom Joseph and Daniel worshipped. Everyone in whose heart Christ abides, everyone who will show forth his love to the world, is a worker together with God for the blessing of humanity. As he receives from the Savior grace to impart to others, from his whole being flows forth the tide of spiritual life. And that is how we are displaying the love of God. God chose Israel to reveal his character to men. He desired them to be as wells of salvation in the world. To them were committed the oracles of heaven, the revelation of God's word will, which is what we are studying in our lines. Um, see, I lost my place. That's what happens. <laughs> in the early days of Israel, the nations of the world, through corrupt practices, had lost the knowledge of God. They had once known Him, but because they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, their foolish heart was darkened. That's from Romans 1.21. Yet in his mercy, God did not blot them out of existence. He, pur he purposed to give them an opportunity of again becoming acquainted with him through his chosen people. Through the teachings of the sacrificial service, Christ was to be uplifted before all nations, and all who would look to him should live. Christ was the foundation of the Jewish economy. The whole system of types and symbols was a compacted prophecy of the gospel, a presentation in which were bound up the promises of redemption. But the people of Israel lost sight of their high privileges as God's representatives, they forgot God and failed to fulfill their holy mission. The blessings they received brought no blessing to the world. All their advantages they appropriated for their own glorification. They shut themselves away from the world in order to escape temptation. The restrictions that God had placed upon their association with idolaters as means of preventing them from conforming to the practices of the heathen they used to build up a wall of separation between themselves and all other nations. They robbed God of the service he required of them, and they robbed their fellow men of religious guidance as a holy example. Priests and rulers became fixed in a rut of ceremonialism. They were satisfied with a legal religion, and it was impossible for them to give to others the living truths of heaven. They thought their own righteousness all-sufficient and did not desire a new element. 
should be brought into their religion. The good will of God to men they did not accept as something apart from themselves, but they connected it with their own merit because of their good works. The faith and works by love at Let's see, the faith that works by love and purifies the soul could find no place for union with the religion of the Pharisees, made up of ceremonies and the injunctions of men. So here we see that ancient Israel, whose experience we can apply to modern Israel, ourselves and the Levites, lost sight of their high privileges as God's representatives. The blessings they received were not shared with the world. The restrictions which were to protect them from the conforming to the practices of the heathen they used as a method to separate themselves from all other nations. They developed a rut of ceremonialism and legalism that made it impossible for them to give to others the living truths of heaven. They depended on their own righteousness. They connected their blessings to their own merit. They, so I've got, um, that's why I put this here. They did not understand that God's truth is a living truth to be shared. They did not desire or accept that a new element should be brought into their religion. The priests and rulers became fixed in a rut that was made of ceremonies and the injunctions of men. So I've got some definitions that I wanted to check some of these words here, and I got most of these definitions from dictionary.com. Fixed means stationary or rigid. I think most of us know what that means as applied to ancient and modern Israel. We've been calling it um, conservatism. Injunction means law or judicial process. Judicial pertains to judgment. Ceremonies can be defined as strict adherence to conventional forms. So priests and rulers became fixed in a rut made of strict adherence to conventional forms and the judgmental laws of men. And I can think, I think that's what we've been talking about in terms of con, uh, conservatism. Mm -hmm. Okay, words related to living, for, because we have living truths of heaven. Breathing, contemporary, dynamic, continuing, current, operative, persisting, and developing. These concepts are not conservative ideas. They are more characteristic of the living plant that develops through the dynamic principles of God's law of nature. I like the word dynamic. According to dictionary.com, the concept of dynamic pertains to or is characterized by energy or effective action. In physics, it means of or relating to force or power. So God is dynamic. He has the power. And it, I, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I like that, besides the fact that it means it, it um, is a living, ongoing, adapting kind of a force. So, the Pharisees did not understand God to be a dynamic power guided by dynamic principles or that he designed the laws of the universe to be dynamic, meaning to be living, breathing, continuing, and developing as we are learning is an element in the concept of dispensations. That's another thing that struck me as I was thinking about this. Um, sermon. In Parmender's recent presentation, we learned that dispensations are God's method of managing his household. They are dynamic, 
or living principles that can be discerned through parabolic study of his word. Parabolic, meaning like parables. Ellen White says, they did not desire or accept that a new element should be brought into their religion. And that really jumped out at me when I saw, read that in that passage. Because, um, I mean, I think that just shows that she knew things were supposed to... I mean, we've learned, too, that, that prophets don't even often know what they're saying when they say it. Mm -hmm. But it's for us at the end of the world. And there it was, big as life, new element. Um, words related to element are fundamental, component, detail, member, principle, aspect, ingredient, and basic. So in God's, and I really, the thing that struck, struck me about ingredient is like it's there, it's always been there, but maybe we didn't realize it was there. I mean, you know when you taste something, you say, there's something in there, I know what it is, but I'm not sure what it is. And then you figure it out. You know, so it's been, new elements have been a part of the ingredient the whole time. So in God's management of his household, there are dispensations which bring in new elements to be discerned as ingredients, components, details, or aspects of his living truth. The word principles pertains to a fundamental, primary, or general law or truth from which others are derived, such as the principles of modern physics. So God's living truths can be understood to be dynamic principles as opposed to fixed injunctions of men. We are learning in our studies that God's work, word is prophetic. Related words are predictive, foreshadowing, presaging, and prognos prognostic. So God gives us a prognosis a prediction, a prophecy regarding the results of our sin, sin which acts as a curse to us, bringing results which are triggered by our own transgressions of his living truths. And I thought that was really interesting when we talked about curse during the Sabbath lesson today, that a curse is really, I mean, we think of it something differently now, but in the vernacular that where it was written originally, it's... Um, uh, my understanding of it then was that it's actually, um, you know, a detail of the of the um, covenant that you know this is what's going to happen if the covenant is broken. As I said earlier, we are learning that God's word is parabolic. I also like the word parabolic. <laughs> it is like a parable. Related words are figurative metaphorical, illustrative, emblematic, and symbolizing. It is teaching us spiritual truths by looking at natural events. It is teaching us spiritual laws which we can discern by understanding natural laws. These are understandings we have been led to by God's word and the spirit of prophecy. These are principles we need to share with Levites. The premise that Sister Emma proposes and with which I agree is that we can learn much from the times of transitions or dispensations in the line of Christ. During these transition times, the disciples were dealing with the understanding of new elements. And I think we've been learning that. When they went, they learned a lot more after the cross. They were learning the new elements. They were letting go of their old ideas and learning the mysteries of heaven. And they had Christ, a living Christ, to share that with them. And we have a living Christ through the Holy Spirit to guide us that way also. In the line of Christ, we see three dispensations which parallel dispensations in our time. 
First is the disciples learning new elements of God's living truth as the priests do in our line. Second is them bringing that new understanding to the Jews or Levites. And the third shows, our, uh, shows the disciples and converted Jews and Levites proclaiming the gospel to the Gentiles and Nephinims throughout the world. Well, I didn't put that on here, but I think we're all familiar with the three lines that was up in, uh, on the board during the Sabbath school, too. Um, the priests are learning the new elements. They're bringing them to the Levites, and together they take them to the world, or the Nephinims. We are in the midst of these transition periods. Although the Levites may be the upcoming harvest, we must understand what to teach them before we go together with them to the Nephinims. And here, this, these three things are indicating the issues that, are, that we're to learn, that, that we've learned, um, uh, you know, is a part of our message. And in Christ's time, their testing message was had to do with the Jew, Jews and the Gentiles and um, breaking down that wall. And then Millerites, the issue was free and bond or slavery. And, and now we have, we have some of the residuals of these things. Actually, we have all of them, and uh, plus gender issues. And Tess said right at the beginning, it's not just a matter of male and female. It, it encompasses gender issues in general. Um, and this reminds me, but as I say this, that uh, the, the what, what, I don't even know how to say it though, but um, maybe you'll understand it anyway. Um, the things like, uh, I guess it's like the three applications of something or other, or like when we have those lines of um, the different wars and stuff, and it's like a, you add them together. So there's a beginning where you start working on this testing stuff, but then that test can, can, is still going to be encompassed in this, and then, that's, and then the two of them is still going to be encompassed in this. So we're going to have to deal with all of these things now, and hopefully, a couple of them have we made headway on, but, and this is the, the one now that we're beginning. <clears throat> so we are in the midst of these transition periods, and we are to learn and teach by being the living example of Christ, how to reflect God's love to all mankind in the world. We are to display his glory equally to Levites, Nephinims, and to those who are slaves, to those who are free, and to all who are discriminated against upon, um, or I mean to say, who all are discriminated upon with regard to gender issues. For as we are all one in Christ, we are all Abraham's seed, and heirs to the promise of salvation. So now I'm going to read um, from Christ Object Lesson 386.1 uh, to 4. The glory of heaven is in lifting up the fallen, comforting the distressed. And wherever Christ abides in human hearts, he will be revealed in the same way. Wherever it acts, the religion of Christ will bless. Wherever it works, there is brightness. No distinction on account of nationality, race, or caste is ever, I mean, let me start over. No distinction on account of nationality, race, or caste is recognized by God. He is the maker of all mankind. All men are of one family by creation, and all are one through redemption. 
Christ came to demolish every wall of partition, to throw open every compartment of the temple, that every soul may have free access to God. Amen. His love is so broad, so deep, so full, that it penetrates everywhere. It lifts out of Satan's circle the poor souls who have been deluded by his deceptions. It places them within reach of the throne of God, the throne encircled by the rainbow of promise. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. All are brought nigh by his precious blood. And that's, uh, she cites Galatians 3.28 and Ephesians 2.13. So this is a little bit different um, and that got me thinking about other things that I was had been led to look at. Um, we're talking about no Jew or no Jew or Greek, no bond or free, no male or female. She characterizes it as nationality, race, or caste, <clears throat> which I think is closer to what's happening now. Whatever the difference in religious belief, a call from suffering humanity must be heard and answered. Where bitterness of feeling exists because of difference in religion. I, you know what? I think I might have... That's good. Did I skip? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> where, where bitterness of feeling exists because of difference in religion, much good may be done by personal service. Loving ministry will break down prejudice and win souls to God. I think we can say here that personal service and loving ministry to everyone and anyone will break down prejudice and win souls to God no matter what the difference is. So, any of these differences. <clears throat> My viewpoint today is also influenced by this passage from um, Signs of the Times, October 17, 1895, paragraph 5 and 6. And this is also, um, uh, this is from the Beatitudes, which I think we are familiar with and love, but don't always think about maybe and uh, try to apply. Um, at least that's been my case. I just, you know, thought it was good, but I haven't thought about it for a long time. But ran across it in studying for this sermon. The whole tenor of Christ's teaching was contrary to that of the rabbis. In his Sermon on the Mount, he tore away the middle wall of partition that separated men one from another through national prejudices and taught the exercise of a love that was to embrace the human race. He said to the people, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Christ teaches that we are to recognize our neighbor in every race and condition of men. No distinction is to be made as to who is our neighbor on the ground of poverty or wealth, or position. The followers of Christ are to see their neighbor in anyone 
who needs their help. All ye are brethren. The Lord has not established a kingdom merely for the rich, and the one essential thing for an entrance into his kingdom is Christ-likeness of character. So I think just now, I was, as I read that, it said, Be ye also perfect as your fathers in heaven. And, and I think we've been thinking of that as the do's and don'ts, you know, mm -hmm. following these, you know, don't do this and do do that. And that is, um, you know, trying to get in there with your own works rather than be perfect as he is in, in loving everyone. Mm -hmm. And that is the Christ-like uh, character that we want to um, develop. Mm -hmm. The lawgiver explained the meaning of the divine precepts and showed that they were not arbitrary requirements but that in doing them, there is life. For Christ, from the pillar of cloud, had distinctly told them that those who did them should live in them. The, commandment, the Ten Commandments are called in the New Testament, the royal law of liberty. In obeying the divine precepts, men will assimilate to the divine character, for the character of God is expressed in his holy law in substituting their own ideas, in erecting their own standards, they will come to misrepresent the Father and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, coming far short of Christ-likeness of character. In erecting a standard for themselves, they will cling to their own deficiencies, practice their own habit, their former habits, and fall far below the perfection of Christ's character. But through the grace of Christ, we should ever strive to reach the perfect standard, uh, the standard of displaying the love of God and Christ-like character. Ellen White says, No distinction on account of nationality, race, or caste is recognized by God. According to dictionary.com, the definition of caste well, let's see. Did I want to go backwards like that? Well, I'll just tell you, my premise here is that Jews and Gentiles are about nationalities. This is about slavery, but not necessarily race. And gender issues are about gender issues in general. For us, it was male, female, then. Okay, so, according to dictionary.com, the definition of caste can be described as any rigid system of social distinctions. It is an <clears throat> endo... This is hard for me to say. Endo... Endo... It comes from endogy, anyway, social group, and that has to do with marriage within a specific tribe or similar social unit. And is... And so that might have to do with gender issues, too, I'm just thinking. And a hereditary social group limited to persons of the same rank, occupation, economic position, etc., and having mores, which means moral views, distinguishing it from other such groups. So a caste system is a social group that has these various components, and, um, and they may be... Um, well, here on the Merriam-Webster.com has another good explanation. It is a system of rigid social stratification which is characterized by social barriers which are sanctioned by custom, law, or religion. So these different these groups in caste systems are relegated to their own place. They aren't, people don't want to... Um, they're, they end up being shunned, anyway, because of custom, law, or religion. I suggest these can also, in, well, I, I suggest these caste systems can include the poor, those suffering economic disparity, the infirm, those suffering with illness or disabilities, as well as those suffering or being relegated 
to an inferior position by sanctions due to issues of gender. From Christian Education 201.1, we read, They should be taught that the gospel of Christ tolerates no spirit of caste, that it gives no place to unkind judgment of others, which tends directly to self-exaltation. <coughs> the religion of Jesus never degrades the receiver, nor makes him coarse and rough, nor does it make him unkind in thought and feeling towards those for whom Christ died. Amen. So, we, so uh, now we look at the transitions of our times which parallel the transition of Christ's times. The disciples are symbolically and prophetically the priests of that time, bringing the understanding of new elements to the Jews as we will to the Levites. There is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. They are cousins. All nations and ethnicities came from the human seed planted by the survival of Noah's family. There is no difference between bond and free. Slavery in the United States was based on skin color. It has also been based on other factors throughout time and even now in many parts of the world. So, there's slavery in the world, and it doesn't have to do with race. It has to do with, you know, people imposing their, uh, are able to impose themselves upon poor, uh, weaker people. There is no race except the human race. Here I want to share some information from my study of this subject, and I have three references up here, which actually are five references, but... I'll explain that. And I didn't have um, enough room to do it, the whole thing, but I got 20 copies here of the expanded references if you want them to access it yourself. So um, the first article is reprinted at, um, yeah, could families share that because I only made 20. <clears throat> an article reprinted at scientificamerican.com called Race is a Social Construct. Scientists argue racial categories are weak proxies for genetic diversity and need to be phased out. And that's by Megan Gannon, and it was, it's reprinted here. It, the original article was in Life Science on February 5th, 2016. The second article was found at Newsweek.com called There is No Such Thing as Race by Robert Wald Sussman. And that was originally printed in uh, 11 8, 14. And it is based on his book called The Myth of Racism, The Troubling and Persistence of an Unscientific Idea. It argues that race is not and never has been a valid biological category in humans. It was published in 2014 by Harvard Uni University Press. And in reading these articles, I found that this, this is, has all, actually been brought up like 100 years ago. And science has pretty much <laughs> proved through um, the study of genetics and all that sort of thing. And many of us may have remembered a few years ago that they uh, discovered that all humanity actually came from Africa and then spread out from there and um, and that the difference in color of skin had to do with their adaptation to their environment and the production of melanin in the skin and that sort of thing and whether you know it had to do with their environment. <clears throat> That's a nutshell. There's more. It's much more scientific than that. Um, and the third article was from the SmithsonianMag.com, dated May 20th, 2019. So it's pretty new. Called The Disturbing Resilience of Scientific Racism. And it's a review of a new book that explores how racist biases continue to maintain a foothold in research today, and it's by Ramin Skiba, 
and the article discusses a new book written by Angel Angela, um, I think it's Saini, and it's called Superior, The Return of Race Science, and it was published May 2nd, 2019 by Beacon Press. The book convincingly argues that the problem of the color line still survives today in 21st century science. And I wish I could share excerpts from these articles, but I don't have time. So hopefully you can access them. Okay, um, continuing. Um, Sister Emma, in her presentation, talks about the mindset of the Jews regarding the Gentiles and says that anyone who was not Jewish was a Gentile. Because, you know, it says Jew and Greek, but anyone who was not a Jewish, uh, Jewish was a Gentile. This is a point I think uh, we all agree on. I want to parallel this to our line regarding the issue about citizenship and immigration, which is definitely an external consideration and may be a factor in the mindset of conservative Adventists as well. We know that the Jewish religion allowed people of other nationalities and ethnic, ethnic origins to convert and participate in their economy. However, they were never considered to be Jewish. And, um, you know, this is kind of a controversial issue, probably even with us. It's just an idea I'm throwing out there. It's not that I really do the really formed a opinion about it, but I think it's kind of interesting to consider. So we read in 2 Samuel 11:3, And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So here we see that a faithful soldier in the army of David, fighting side by side with the Israelite, is still singled out as being a Hittite. So the point is made mm. that he's not part of Israel, even mm. though he converted and married into it. For many years in the U.S., there have been people <clears throat> allowed to enlist in our military forces who are from other nations with the intention and hope to go through a process of becoming citizens. There are many people who are part of DACA, um, that DACA situation, who have lived their entire lives in the U.S., who were brought here as children and know no other country as their home who are under a threat of de deportation. Mm. I read a story about a young Iraqi national who had grown up here from a young child. I'm not sure of his age. I think it was somewhere between 19 and 21. He was deported to Iraq. He spoke only English. He did not know anyone there. Mm. He had nowhere to live but on the street. But he met foul play there on the street and he was killed. Yeah. Mm. The problem with being a nationalist is that many show favoritism toward allowing immigration from nations that are more like us in color and ethnic culture, and have prejudice about those who are of a different color and a different ethnic culture and religion. So I think that's what's playing in here in terms of nationalism. And, um, other biblical references, we see that what has been considered by many to be racism. In Deuteronomy 23, 3 and 4, we read, An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation <coughs> shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when ye came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor of Hathor of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. So it wasn't really forever, it was for ten generations. <clears throat> Here we see God saying they can't worship together for ten generations, but it is not a race issue. It is due to the character they displayed. The Ammonite and Moabite were actually relatives of the Israelites, but they were of differing nations, ethnic cultures, and religions. 
and um, that's why they were ostracized. Another issue of nations and not race. Another point to be made in this story, uh, another point to be made is in the story of Noah regarding slavery. First, we'll look at the verses about Canaan in Genesis 9, 22 and 27. I'm going to read a summary of the verses. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm just reading Ham's summary. It's good. Ham uncovers the nakedness of his father, Noah. He breaks Levitical law, and we can see that in Leviticus 18, 6, and 7, it says that you shouldn't uncover the nakedness of your father. As a result, this wrong behavior affects his children. So God says in verse 25, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. So as a result, of this, as a result the son of Ham is going to to suffer the consequences of his bad behavior and becomes a servant, like a slave to his brethren. Ellen White tells us that the sins of the father are often practiced by the children. We know that people are not punished by someone else's sin, so Canaan is going to be punished because he practices the same sin as his father Ham. The triggering of the curse is due to the seed of bad behavior being shown in the family of Ham down through Canaan and his generations. We see in um, Prophets and uh, is it Patriarchs and Prophets 118.1, the posterity of Canaan descended to the most degrading forms of heathenism. Continuing in the paragraph, it says, Though the prophetic curse had doomed them to slavery, the doom was withheld for centuries. God bore with their impiety and corruption until they passed the limits of divine forbearance. Then they were dispossessed and became bondmen to the descendants of Shem and Japheth. So here again, well I guess it's in my dear record. Sister Emma, in her presentation, points out for us to see that this curse was prophetic. What that means, she tells us, is that God did not punish Canaan for his sin by saying, I'm going to curse you now for what you've done. He prophesied what would happen because of his actions. This is fundamental in our understanding of the character of God that he does not curse people. He says, because of what you are doing, I'm prophesying what will happen to you. Because of the actions that you're taking, you are going to become a slave. So here too, the slaves were not men of a different race. They were relatives of their masters. Another of her examples is looking at the male-female discussion through the outcome in the history of Adam and Eve. We can see that Eve was cursed in childbearing as a result of her sin. She's going to suffer headship of her husband, and also childbirth is going to be difficult. The whole process of having children and then raising them is going to be difficult. And she points out that the reasons may be because of the division between the husband and wife and the headship that arises as the result of Eve's sin. Adam's life also becomes difficult due to his sin and his work in providing the food becomes a hard task. The relationship of the husband and wife changes due to these events. Eve has a greater need of Adam's strength as a provider, while she is having greater difficulties in her role as a wife and mother. Mm -hmm. So these are circumstances that evolve from the transgression of their sins. Now, let's look at some thoughts found on um, Acts of the Apostles 459, 1 through 3. In the context, Paul is writing a letter to Philemon, the slave owner, about the slave Onesimus 
Ellen White says Paul's letter to Philemon shows the influence of the gospel upon the relation between master and servant. And, in, and this is very important when it comes to the slave argument. Because on one level, we say the whole Bible endorses slavery. But we are able to see that in this history, at the time of Christ, Christ is laying the foundation to do away with slavery. In the letter, Paul is offering himself as an intercessor between the slave and the master. And like Moses, identifying with the children of Israel, he says words similar to, if you want to punish Onimus, punish me instead. Because that's how much his heart is filled with love for Onimus and Philemon. So let's not miss that point, because the whole purpose of the gospel is displaying the love of God. Sister White goes on to say, that slaveholding was an established institution throughout the Roman Empire, and both masters and slaves were found in most of the churches in which Paul labored. She goes on to talk about how both the lust and appetite of the health wealthy classes led them to treat their slaves badly. She says the tendency of the whole system was hopelessly degrading. At the, time, at the same time, she says that it was not the apostles' work to overturn arbitrarily or suddenly the established order of society. In this history, it's such an integral part of society, it wasn't Paul's work to overthrow it. And she gives the reason. To attempt this is to prevent the success of the gospel. So the whole focus of God is the success of the gospel, the success of his purpose for the church. In society at that time, if Paul had overthrown slavery, it would have hindered the gospel. What God is going to do during Christ's time is support the overthrow of the system of Jew-Gentile prejudice, because that is the next thing needed to further the work of the gospel. So we see, you know, things happen in God's time. We know that. We learn that in, in our own experience. There has to be a process. We also learn that to progression. First things first, and then build upon it. So it wasn't time to abolish slavery then. It was time to break down this wall between the Jews and the Gentiles. And it was left to the time of the Millerite line to be tested on the issue of slavery in terms of what we call racism. The prejudice against people of color. And it was left to our line to pass similar tests successfully, as well as a test regarding the equality about gen gender issues. Emma's main point is that how it looks in our transition periods can be revealed in studying the transition periods during Christ's time. The internal work in the church at that time was to prepare the disciples to finish the work of bringing the Gospels to the Gentiles. And we can see this work of preparation in Acts of the Apostles 161.1. The, the Christian church was at this time entering upon an important era the work of proclaiming the gospel message among the Gentiles was now to be prosecuted with vigor. And as a result, the church was to be strengthened by a great ingathering of souls. The apostles who had been appointed to lead out in this work would be exposed to suspicion, prejudice, and jealousy. Their teachings concerning the breaking down of the middle wall of partition uh, from Ephesians 2.14, that had so long separated the Jewish and the Gentile world, would naturally subject them to the charge of heresy. And their authority as ministers of the gospel would be questioned by many zealous, <coughs> believing Jews. God foresaw the difficulties that his servants would be called to meet, and in order that their work should be above challenge, 
he instructed the church by revelation, which I think we're, we're having in our, in our movement, mm -hmm. to set them apart publicly to the work of the ministry. Their ordination was a public recognition of their divine appointment to bear to the Gentiles the glad tidings of the gospel. So, su suspicion, prejudice, and jealousy. That's what we're going through also. And I believe we have also been charged with heresy, and the authority of our ministers have been questioned by Adventists who have been a part of our movement. But God foresaw the difficulties that his servants would be called to meet, and he will reveal to us what is needed to be done when it is time to be set apart for the public work of ministry. So I think we need faith that God's timing is perfect and these things will be revealed to us as we go along. Amen. I want to remind us of a few things. God's law is a living truth. Its principles are dynamic, prophetic, and parabolic. But I wrote here that living truths means breathing, dynamic, developing. And God doesn't curse us, we curse ourselves if we transgress the law of love. God always has a way to heal and redeem us if we seek Him and trust Him. New elements are introduced as new dispensations develop. I think that's important to remember, and I really feel like this is a, a, a confirmation of our lines. And, and, and the idea of dispensations. Dispensations are God's method of managing his household. Thus, Christ sought to teach the disciples the truth that in God's kingdom there are no territorial lines, no caste, no aristocracy, that they must go to all nations, bearing to them the message of a Savior's love. But not until later did they realize, in all its fullness, that God hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth. One blood. Mm -hmm. Which I think goes back to what they're talking about here, that there's only one race, the human race. Um, okay hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. So he's, God is not far from every one of us. He wants us to seek him and and we know that if we seek him, he is a rewarder of those Amen. who seek him. No distinction on account of nationality, race, or caste is recognized by God. The gospel is to be proclaimed and accessible to everyone throughout the world. Jesus said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. That's what we need to, that's how we um, display the love of God. So in closing, I'm going to read um, Acts of the Apostles 593.2. And this is the last chapter of that book. We started with the first chapter, now this is the last chapter. We will see that the purpose of the church is the same at the end as it uh, was at the beginning. We will see that the line of Christ was successful, prophesying that our line will be successful also. <coughs> Sister White writes, The commission that Christ gave to the disciples they fulfilled. As these messengers of the cross went forth to proclaim the gospel, there was such a revelation of glory of God as had never been 
at, that have never before been witnessed by mortal man. Isn't that what we're expecting when we go with the Levites to the Nethanes? Yeah. As we witness to them. By the cooperation of the Divine Spirit, the Apostles did a work that shook the world. To every nation was the Gospel carried in a single generation. Using the principles that were illustrated from the first chapter, we could replace the words, Revelation of the Glory of God, with such a display of the love of God. So we can say there was such a display of the love of God as had never before been witnessed by mortal man. And we know here at the end of the world that it is our job to do the same as the disciples, to carry the gospel to the world in a single generation. Amen. So that is the end. And I hope it's been a blessing. It was a blessing to me to work on it. Amen. So let's... Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your Sabbath and the opportunity to come together and uh, commune with you and commune with each other and to study your word and to learn more and understand better your love for us, that we might be able to display that love to the world. Thank you for everything and, and just we praise you and love you and are grateful for being here and learning your present truth. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.